Howdy everyone! I had a lot of fun on the last vid covering flow fields. Y'all had a ton of great feedback and ideas, so thanks so much for the awesome response. I was surprised at the interest in compute shaders. There was even a petition for me to convert the flow field itself into a compute shader. I thought about it for a little bit, and my response you may ask? Ask and ye shall receive, dude 2542. Let's dive in. So a quick disclaimer before we get started, I am in no way claiming to be a graphics programming expert. I'll try my best to fact check stuff in this vid, but some statements and some of the techniques I use in this implementation may be suboptimal as I am learning as I go for this video. So if you watched my last video, which by the way you should definitely watch if you're unfamiliar with flow fields, you'll see that performance is something to think about when using flow fields. The strategies I mentioned in that video work great for improving performance using flow fields in a lot of games, but sometimes you want massive flow fields that can update in real time to capture frequent updates. Frequent updates could be scenes where there are multiple rapidly moving targets, several simultaneous flow fields, or dynamic obstacles where you can build and destroy the environment. Programming for the GPU with shaders is definitely not a walk in the park, but they are crazy fast, and I'd love to see how quick I can get it running. So why not give it a shot? Let's see how much performance we can squeeze out of my little GTX 970 while learning a thing or two on the way. Okay, let's think about design for our GPU flow field. What are we working with? What problems need to be solved? Those familiar with the basic flow field algorithm know there are two high level steps to creating a flow field. There is the cost calculation step, which is a breadth first search out from the target cell to calculate the cost. And then there's the flow direction calculation step, which is simply using those costs to calculate a field of vectors pointing to the target. My plan was to make two separate compute shader scripts, one to handle each step of the process. And like I mentioned, the cost calculation does a BFS, breadth first search, which unfortunately is a pretty sequential algorithm. You'll see why this is important in a bit. Like the whole concept of searching is you start with little or nothing and you slowly build up information needed to find the target. GPUs have massive performance improvement potential for many workloads, and all the credit goes to how they are designed to process data massively in parallel using SIMD architectures, allowing them to execute the same operation on several data points simultaneously. So breaking this down, we have the MD multiple data. Easy, that's our grid cells, the costs, and the flow directions. But to get the most out of your GPU, it's ideal to write your shaders so that each thread runs very similar instructions. That's the SI part of the acronym, single instruction. And that's also why if you listen closely, you can hear the distant screams of graphics programmers every time you type the word if in a shader. If you have straggler threads running complex edge case logic, you may run into issues synchronizing the threads, and the GPU still has to wait for these to finish before telling the CPU about the results. This can drastically reduce the effectiveness of your compute shaders. We know the CPU version of the flow field algorithm maintains a queue structure and it pulls the cells in it to search one at a time while also adding any unseen neighbor cells to this queue as it goes. Most implementations have the logic operate out of a while loop with branching logic and they use dynamic data structures. This doesn't mesh well with SIMD. Trying to diverge from the entire purpose of GPU execution by jerry-rigging a sequential algorithm on it is like trying to row a boat on dry land. I mean, you might be able to drag it forward, but that's really not what it was built for. And already, that's our first major problem. Making BFS, a sequential algorithm, execute in parallel on the GPU is probably the biggest challenge of this project. But we're not going to let that stop us. Surely there's a way to look at this concurrently. Or, if we go back to our boat analogy, maybe we could make some kind of cursed boat-car hybrid. You know what else is cursed? Surfing the internet without a VPN. Yep, I've partnered with NordVPN to bring you this video. NordVPN provides internet safety with a single click. NordVPN is the fastest VPN on the planet, and also one of the most trusted internet security providers on the market. And the facts back this up. Protect your data, hide your IP address, and rest easy knowing you won't be tracked online. NordVPN also helps you avoid phishing, scams, and malware. And you can set your VPN location to one of 118 countries so you don't miss your favorite content while traveling abroad. NordVPN was also rated the number one VPN of 2025 by TechRadar. 
Given how much we rely on the internet today, it's hard to find a reason to sleep on NordVPN. I've been using NordVPN on my PC and phone, and I've been very impressed how easy it was to set up and get instant peace of mind. You can try out NordVPN now, risk-free, with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Get a whopping 72% off by signing up at nordvpn.com slash deepdivedev. Big thanks to NordVPN for teaming up with me on this video. Using my link helps support the channel. Now back to the video. So we've laid out the problem and the obstacles, but let's talk a little bit about implementation. Real quick, a little bit about how compute shaders work. Well, compute shaders run on the GPU and GPUs operate in work groups containing a ton of threads, usually up to around 1024 of them. So I figure we're going to need to split the work up as equally as we can between one or more groups of 1024 threads to get the best performance gains while aligning with SIMD best practices. So I guess the next logical question is, how do we split a grid breadth first search into 1024 chunks of logic? My first thought was to have each thread run in a while loop until the frontier is empty. It updates the frontier and cost buffers when it's assigned a frontier index is ready for processing. There were a couple of problems I had to address getting this implementation up. First off, the frontier is typically a queue data structure, which gets its memory allocated dynamically. And unfortunately, compute shaders seem to have pretty limited access to dynamic memory allocation and what I've seen. To work around this, I allocated a large frontier buffer, essentially an array of grid cell indices, where I would store a couple indices tracking the next queue index and the index of the top of the frontier. You can imagine trying to keep data consistent across thousands of threads implementing the same code is difficult. And you're absolutely right. But thankfully, GLSL supports atomic operations we can use to put a lock on variables so they aren't modified as they are read. For the atomic variables I mentioned that are tracking our frontier indices, we can use atomic add passing the index and the amount to add to read its exact value and add one to it without having to worry about race conditions and stale values. We can rest easy knowing that using atomic add will increment the shared variable by one and no two threads in the same group will process the same index. It seemed like a good plan and I kind of got this step running, but not perfectly to be honest. I actually went with a different approach because our current setup just just felt kind of jank, having a busy idle while loop in a compute shader, not to mention the lack of synchronization between threads during the search. Some threads zoomed ahead of others, making it not a true BFS and yielding inconsistent results. Now it's looking like we should probably take a step back and try another approach. Let's go back to the drawing board. This time we are tackling the BFS in waves with synchronization at the end of each wave using a barrier. It also uses a different frontier storage approach. It simply swaps the next frontier buffer with the current frontier buffer at the end of each wave. So in an empty grid, the frontier starts with just one element, the target cell. The next wave, assuming we include diagonals, is eight elements. The one after that, 16, and then 24, and so on. So the larger the frontier, the more we can take advantage of parallelism. We just search out and waves until we've seen everything. This should help us get consistent results and no threads should get ahead of each other, giving us those weird looking flow fields we dealt with earlier. Now we have less branching, no cursed busy idle, more synchronization between threads, more consistent results, and it's just plain easier to work with. Awesome. We got the cost calculation BFS compute shader working, now it should just be smooth sailing while we write the flow direction calculation shader. The second shader was actually pretty easy to get working as expected. It doesn't need to be sequential. There are no dependencies outside the cost values from the previous step. And we already know exactly how much work needs to be done. I just assigned each cell to a thread and had it do the usual neighbor check to find the cheapest neighbor and figure out the flow direction. With this strategy, I eventually got it working great. But wait. Now we're probably bottlenecked by updating the rendering to display all the flow directions. While most games won't need to display all the flow directions, only query them, it's good to be able to performantly visualize all this data we are working with. So off I went starting another side quest. 
Let's think about the most performant ways to render things in Godot. Well, we could have a sprite for each arrow, but it's probably going to be slow to update and it's going to pollute the scene tree. Tile maps are also probably going to be pretty slow to iterate over and update every frame. Definitely in GDScript and probably in C++ too for larger grids. And it's even bottlenecked with a super fast multi mess instance 2D setup. I did a video about this earlier, talking about the benefits of this, but even this has limitations. With this setup, we would still have to have a script tell the multi mesh what all the new transforms are as the flow field updates. To work around this expensive CPU processing, I made a quick particle shader to position and rotate arrows based on the flow field directions I passed to it as a uniform. Except I learned this doesn't work if you have a massive array, which is exactly what my directions array is. So yeah, there's an array size limit and uniforms for particle shaders in Godot because they're stored in super speedy constant GPU memory which comes in shorter supply than regular VRAM. Hmm, so now what? Well, the cool thing is we can still pass the particle shader the directions, we just need to pass them encoded in a texture. Okay, that sounds cool, how do we do this? Well, each pixel can store four float values in the range 0 to 1. Each flow direction is a vector 2, in other words, two float values, and each of our flow directions are going to be in the range negative 1 to 1. So we just need to transform the direction vectors to the correct range and store the x and y values in the r and g channels in the compute shader. We just made a simple modification to the flow direction shader to update a texture with the correct colors. Awesome! We got the particle shader arrows to appear, and all the work is done with little to no CPU bottlenecks. But if you take a gander, you may notice we have some issues here with accuracy of our flow field. Even though we tackled our cost calculation step in synchronized waves, we still are struggling with some race conditions in our shader. So as any experienced graphics programmer would do, I just threw a crap ton of group memory barrier, memory barrier buffer, memory barrier shared, and barriers everywhere until it just calmed down. Really, the main issue was some threads were checking neighbors way ahead of others. The most obvious spot where this happens with, say, this BFS searching in a straight wave, where this cell here checks this neighbor at the same time these other two cells check it. This might not be a problem sometimes, but take a look at this other scenario. We have this environment where the search goes around this middle obstacle, as expected, but when they meet in the middle, you'll notice that several cells on the left side and right side are both neighbors with all these middle cells. Even if we synchronize at each wave, it's fairly likely that more than one of these six cells sharing this neighbor are going to try modifying its cost at the same time, aka a race condition. We want no flickers, but we also want our flow field to be predictable and deterministic. So what I did was synchronize after each neighbor check, so it's possible for two threads to check a mutual neighbor at the same time. Nothing will ever conflict if we only check one direction at a time. So drawing in some obstacles to test it, it looks fine at a glance, but you might notice it flows into the corners kind of awkwardly. The obvious one being where it drags into the neighboring obstacle. This can be especially annoying if your obstacles are also physics bodies. To fix the dragging, I just added a check to make sure there's no mutual orthogonal obstacle when finding the flow direction. The flow also tries to squeeze through corners like this, something that not everyone is going to want. With physical obstacles, it results in a bunch of dead ends in the pathfinding. 
To fix this, I just added an extra check in the BFS to ignore neighbors if they have two orthogonal obstacles in common with the current cell. At last, it works, and it works great. Let me show you something. Here's our GD script flow field of size 100 by 100 from last episode, but this time it's updating 60 times a second. One to two frames per second. Dog water. Let's be real. We obviously don't want to update it that often, but I can never say no to more performance. Now moving on to our shiny new GPU flow field, you can see it runs the same field at the same update rate and it renders it at over 950 frames a second, which is absolutely crazy, I know. With this performance, I could probably scale this up to 3D and use it for real-time 3D flow field pathfinding. There could be a game using a system like this to simulate complex weather and wind patterns to move clouds, carry smoke or rustle foliage, or even ocean currents. Unfortunately, I must say, if you have really complex maze-like environments, the algorithm never really gets a chance to grow the frontier into a size that can be highly parallelized. This runs much slower. And one thing I learned that I thought was pretty interesting is that one CPU thread is actually going to be much better at sequential execution than a single GPU thread. But I mean, if you do have a narrow maze environment, you probably shouldn't be using flow fields in the first place, no matter how you compute it. But there are a couple other implementations of Parallel BFS that I've been eyeing that seem to address this and even improve performance in the best case with a few different strategies. But boy do some of them look complex. I'll have to save some of that for another vid if you guys are interested. Well I hope you enjoyed today's dive on GPU flow fields. I had a blast on this one and I learned so much. As usual, I have the source code for this project and all my previous ones uploaded on my Patreon. Thanks so much to all my supporters. You guys help me continue to put out quality content regularly. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.